My name is Tal Kitron with Aperuf Tutoring Services. I'm a premium tutor working mostly doing online ACT, SAT, and PSAT prep these days. Uh, I worked in the Atlanta office for several years and have been with the company for almost a decade. Now I'm coming to you from near Boulder, Colorado. And today we're going to be talking about final exam season, which for those of us on the semester system is coming up right around the corner. And we're going to be discussing executive function and other strategies. So whether you're a student, parent, educator, uh, there's going to be a lot that applies. I don't want people to take every slide as gospel, but the hope is that you'll come out thinking, okay, I've got a lot of new strategies and ways to think about how I study. So without further ado, our company uh, is all about changing students' self-beliefs. I think instilling self-confidence, uh, self-efficacy is a huge part of teaching and tutoring. I've always felt great about that aspect of the work here. And the three cornerstones are test prep, which is my bread and butter, academic tutoring, and then executive function coaching. I can tell you more about those later. So what are executive functions? Um, I should have mentioned there's closed captioning available. You can click out of it. Uh, and if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and I'll get to those at the end. So this is, these are skills on a spectrum, right? Not everyone will have the same level of planning skills and time management. And while some, someone may be very high on the planning, they may have lower efficacy in self-monitoring. These are skills that are developed throughout life. Even without coaching or teaching, they develop, at least through a certain age, as your brain develops and matures. These are also skills that can be coached. So that's why Operative now does executive function coaching, which I think is super cool, which can help students plan and prioritize and organize and set and persist and attain goals, et cetera. But remember that it's a spectrum, not everyone's the same and these skills can be uh, bolstered. Some of the skills we're gonna talk through in the first few slides of this presentation are planning, prioritizing, staying organized. Time management, of course, is a huge one. And I think kind of as an undercurrent with all of these, setting goals and then metacognition, which is thinking about how we think this is really kind of the gold standard cornerstone of executive functioning. Uh, if you have great me metacognitive ability, then that can help your ability to access the other skills, become better at planning and managing your time. So we're gonna talk about all of these a little bit. So when it comes to planning, we talk about what's called the future sketch, where you plan backwards. Uh, if you look at AC, SAT, ACT as an example, we're always looking at, here's the test we're prepping for, Let's schedule sessions in mock tests and reviews backwards from that so that we're making sure that the person is leading up to that test with confidence and momentum. Same is true for a final exam. And you may have four or five tests in a week or two span, so it's even more important than to plan backwards from each test. And thinking about how you do what you do. So this is getting into the metacognition a little bit. But with this current round of exams coming up, you wanna be able to reflect on prior efforts, both good and bad. Really important to think about not just the bad, which is what always comes to mind, this negative testing experiences. Think about when things went well. That one test, that went really well. What strategy did you use? Uh, how did that help me? So what about that strategy was helpful? What won't I or will I do again next time? Right, and, and this is obviously, for final exams that we're talking about today, but this is in every aspect of life. This is, can be helpful. And then thinking about what other strategies will you use next time? So really reflecting on past experiences and using them to prepare for what's coming. And it's important to know patterns. So like how have you performed historically on AP history or on history tests generally? Uh, based on that, maybe we need to change some things. Maybe I shouldn't be preparing in a group because I get distracted. Um, maybe I need to prepare for longer or in a different type of burst of sessions. Uh, sometimes confidence is a thing. I see a lot of students who are overconfident, but even more who are low in confidence and that affects their abilities. Um, and then just kind of being honest with yourself. So this is hard work. Parents can help, but a lot of times, especially in like the 10th, 11th, 12th grade years, 
I remember not liking a lot of what my parents had to say. And so it was better if I heard it from someone else, even if that was, you know, it could have been a friend, it could have been a mentor, a tutor, or a fellow student. But ultimately, if this can come from within, that's the ideal, right? So assessing yourself and thinking, where did I go wrong? Where did I go right? How should I change? I think establishing goals is an important aspect of all test taking. And so you want to be thinking about uh, outcome, but then really process to get you to the desired outcome. So here's an example. If we're shooting for, I want to get an A or a B in every class. Looking at a few different uh, case studies. So like if AP World History, you have an 88.4, you can assess, you need at least a 92 on the exam to get an A for the year. That's pretty huge. I mean, that means that you got to put a lot of effort in, really make sure that you get that A on the exam so you can boost your B to an A. Then if environmental sciences are 97.5, we don't want to just take the final, but if we know that we could score a 65 and still get an A and we're fine with that, we might not prep for that one that much. And that is just logical. Or then we see an 84 in honors algebra two. So getting an A doesn't really feel that likely, but if you get a really, low score, you might drop to a C. So being realistic about, I'm probably going to land on a B. Let me do the not minimum amount of work, but a smart amount of work to make sure. And then if you got an 80, well, that's a big priority because we can drop that down to a C with just anything below an 80. So big priority for honor Spanish and world history for this particular student. Once we have kind of discussed and thought through planning, prioritization is the next executive function skill that we really need to make sure that we're developing. So the more critical the task, the more time you want to allocate towards it. This piggybacks off the last point a little bit. But usually, I mean, sometimes seniors have only one or two finals and depending on the school, you never know, but usually we've got four or five or six finals, sometimes AP exams as well. And so we got to make sure that we're putting priority on the ones that you are less confident with or the score is more important. So if you know the score is super important on AP US world history, uh, that's the one that's going to get prioritized. It also has to do with what test is when. So if your easiest test is first, you might be tempted to study for that first, but it may not make that much sense. So just being thoughtful about how we prioritize. And what it means by treating every subject discreetly is everything separate. So how much time do I need to focus on the multiple choice part of the world history test? And how do I study for that? And if the world history test is on Wednesday, when should I start studying for that, given that I've got another test on Monday? And that, that'll be different depending on your schedule and each person. We can't always know for sure how long something will take, but we should estimate. You don't want to go sit down and think, well, I have this task that could take 30 minutes or five hours, and I'm not sure. You want to have a general idea of how long you're going to take on it so you can set up some time to take breaks. And I, I do think that this is something that I didn't do much in high school, but would change is planning before you start to review. So not just sitting down with your notes. And we're going to look today at a few ways to do that. Motivation is an important aspect. So I talk about this a lot with my students, confidence, momentum, and motivation. Setting a goal is important for that, right? You don't want to just be saying, yeah, I just want a good score, or I just, I don't want to do poorly, right? You want to set us a, a number score if possible. Um, making sure that you write that down and declare your intention, right? If we don't achieve a goal, that is not the end of the world. We want to set high goals. Sometimes we'll make mistakes and we'll learn from those. But if we don't set goals, then we're not going to develop as efficiently. If it's a type of exam where you can only miss a certain number then and still get a certain grade, know that number. Right? We talk about that sometimes on SAT. It's graded on a curve. We know that missing two writing questions can cost you 20, 30, 40 points. So for a perfect score, someone needs to be pretty much perfect on the, that second section. Uh, calibrate your progress. I would say celebrate your progress as well but also calibrate your progress towards achieving that goal. So in other words, reassess as you go, set a goal and then make sure that you are on the right path to achieving it. 
parents can help with motivation, but at the same time, um, I think as a tutor, I think I can help a lot because I'm more of a mentor friend relationship teacher. And again, sometimes from parents, it falls on deaf ears. So you have to pick your battles and find a balance. Some students do really well with a little bit of parental motivation. Others will do much better with a laissez-faire, let them kind of do their own thing. So very person specific, family specific. Herman Ebbinghaus, who is the person who came up with the learning curve and also the forgetting curve. He was a German scientist and mathematician back in like late 19th century, early 20th. And the forgetting curve is just that if you learn something and then you don't revisit it, you will forget it. <laughs> and I mean, we, I, I've, I'm in my late 30s and I've learned and forgotten more than I care to admit in my life. And even my high school students, by junior year, there's so much packed in that people are already forgetting things and need refreshers. So the, the forgetting curve is that if you review it, you kind of re-up to 100%, and then you also retain it longer, right? And so you can see the more you revisit and review after one, three days, five days, six days, the more you will retain it and the longer you will. So this guy Ebbinghaus did a study on himself and he, uh, he was just one of the first scientists to talk to, to learn about memory uh, and study memory. And he said, the things that he learned, if he didn't reinforce them or anchor them, which we'll talk about, then the information went away pretty quickly. So like over half of it was gone in an hour. After six days, he didn't remember more than a fourth of the information. But then when he changed it and he studied three times in three days, he remembered his what he was studying for much longer. And every study of interval increased the strength of his memory. So there wasn't like a diminishing returns. Every time he reviewed it, he reinforced it and remembered it more. So the, the lesson there is just don't think, I think math teachers make this mistake. I've taught it, you know it, let's test it. That's not how it works for pretty much anyone. You teach it and then you reteach it, relearn it, teach it a different way, and then at some point it sticks. I'm a big napper. Um, I took a nap today. And sometimes it can have you wake up a little bit discombobulated, which is what I felt today. But it's also very important for like now I feel alert, right? And awake for my presentation. Uh, even if it's a shorter nap, 20, 30 minute cat or dog nap, as you see here, it can be almost as effective as a full night's sleep. So if you learn something and then sleep, it sticks. I really believe in that. Um, in law school, I would, instead of pulling all-nighters, I would study until I was super, super tired. So maybe sometimes I was even just 11 p.m. or midnight. I know a lot of juniors are laughing at me because they're up until 4 a.m. Uh, but I would find that if I fell asleep or went to sleep at like 11 p.m., even if it was for like an hour or two and then woke up at 1 or 2 a.m., I was just, I could do it. If I tried to pull an all-nighter by the morning, I was useless. Uh, but the cool thing here is that if you learn something, going to sleep shortly after actually lets you retain it more and it prevents other things from interfering, which we're going to talk about. <sighs> more dog naps here, but knowing your biorhythm, so when you're studying does matter, right? Are you more effective late or early? Most of my students will say, well, I'm better late at night. And for some of them, I definitely think that's true. But for others, it's like, well, I want to, I want to, you know, I have so much stuff during the day and I want to, God forbid, like go out to dinner with a friend or uh, we've got athletics or we've got music or we've got plays. And so sometimes the only option is studying late. But as you kind of get into junior, or senior year, especially senior year, and you can control your schedule more. Uh, and then especially when you get to college, you need to know when are you most effective. Right. Taking, for example, me taking a philosophy course at 8 a.m. in college was a terrible idea. Right? My brain was not working for that at that point. If it had been 8 p.m., I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more. So that can also come into play with scheduling. But I think that uh, when studying for final exams, it's do you want to take out the hardest thing first, last or in the middle? And I think there is a lot of schools of thought on that. It's different for everyone. I do think breaks are hugely important. 
especially if you have a, a learning difference, right? If, if a lot of my students are have ADHD uh, or processing issues, and so if that happens, then maybe they have extended time. That's a blessing and a curse because then you're there instead of for two hours for three and a half. Um, taking short breaks is crucial. We'll talk about the 50-10 rule later. Active breaks are the best. So even if it's just rolling your neck and shoulders, walking around, stretching, or a quick trip outside, depending on the weather. But those little breaks let your glucose stores replenish. And they really, I feel like even in tutoring, I find that if you go for too long and, and without a break, it's just both tutor and student get drained. It's much more effective to take a couple of short breaks, right, and then check back in. Here you see, I believe, chimney sweeps on a break. Um, how do we do this? I mean, I think sometimes you actually have to structure breaks. Uh, I mean, uh, one executive functioning skill is literally planning out your breaks and putting them on a calendar or putting them in your stopwatch or, or on, the, on the phone. And so there's very few things that if you do them for two, three hours at a time, that almost everything would be better if you put it down for 10 minutes in there in a couple different intervals. So just knowing that you don't want to burn yourself out and just study, 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 you're actually better off and will retain more, literally retain more information if you take a break. You mentioned the interference a little bit. So the interference theory is the theory that we can only hold so much in our mind. And short-term memory can get squeezed out by longer-term memory. Uh, that's why, for example, again, I go back to ACT, SAT, if there are two, a comparison passage, we read the first passage and then do those questions and then go back and read the second passage. If you read both passages first, some of the second passage will squeeze out the first passage and then you'll struggle on those early questions. So keeping a limited amount of information in our brain at once because we only have that much capacity. Uh, again, interestingly, minimal activity after studying. So if you study and then just like take a quick nap, it can have a positive effect. So it just kind of imprints. It's a very interesting thing. If we, oh, this is important too. So just like if you go for an hour or, or 30 minutes even on one topic uh, or, or on anything, it gets just old, you need breaks. If you focus only on one thing, people will retain less and just zone out more. So what we'll do in a tutoring session is we'll start with punctuation and clauses in the first session but I'm not gonna spend the whole time on English because it'll get boring and stale. We'll switch then to a little bit of math, totally different. Brand new, doesn't push out the English stuff, but does change pace, right? And then finish with some reading skills, going back to verbal. So the longer you stick, the more there's interference and the less someone will be able to encode it into their brain. Now, practically, when you're reviewing it, you want to uh, sometimes mix things up so like, you don't want to always say, all right, I remember this if it's in this order, but maybe you jump around, like if it's a history class and look at like something from the 19th and the 17th and the 18th and make sure that it all fits in your brain, not just as a linear thing. And then if we are taking more breaks, which we should, you have to plot in more starts and stops. So sometimes if, if people have lower executive function skills of persistence and kind of that starting, right? Some people are great at, at starting tasks, but bad at finishing or vice versa. If you know that about yourself, then this will be a challenge. And you'll have to build in these beginnings and endings schedule for yourself. I like that what's interesting here, and it's, I, I actually found it true, but looking at pictures of nature even has some beneficial effects, but best case would be, can you take a little walk with the dog? Uh, ideally in nature rather than in the city, right? We have minimal options sometimes, but just, you can only stay attuned for so long. Our system needs to rest or reboot. That's why I would never do more than a 90 minute online session. Two hours is too long, even with breaks. 90 minutes sometimes is pushing it, but it's just a matter of understanding how much can we bite off without burning out, right? Or without some of it leaking out of our mind. This dovetails with something later that I think it actually kind of, there's two competing schools of thought. So definitely moving around for me helps changing context. I think though that's a balance with having a really 
straight and kind of refined and efficient study area where you have a, a kind of can go to it. Uh, but if you're finding that your one study spot with friends in the media center isn't doing the trick, then maybe you need something different. Maybe you need to be outside or need to be at home, right? Or need to be at a coffee shop. So explore and figure out what really works well for you. It doesn't have you too distracted. And moving around will also may help with later retrieval because you might think, oh, right, I was in the picnic bench in the park when I learned about this. And maybe you'll recall it more easily rather than if you learned everything in the same spot. I think decreasing the possibility of off-task behavior is a huge challenge. We've all just got our phones, you know, so handy. Uh, if you have a more disciplined environment, then you, there are fewer moments where you have to be relying on your own willpower to like stop yourself and like say, don't grab the phone. Whether that's keeping the phone in another room uh, or just having it not within reach, right? You're charging it while you're studying. Um, or, you know, maybe that the phone isn't the distraction for you. It's, uh, could be like a sibling, right? Or it could be a pet. And so making sure that you've got headphones on with something that won't distract you. I mean, these are all things that you have to understand for yourself. And so uh, when we coach executive functioning, it's really about trusting the student, right? And working with them to figure out what's, what's working, what isn't. Too much clutter can distract. So we have limited attention, as we said, and students definitely do better in sparer and more uh, less cluttered environments. So both digitally and in analog life, we want to declutter, and you'll see here what I mean by declutter digitally. Minimize distractions when you're studying. This is the part that kind of goes against what we said earlier. Use your regular study area. So I do think it's good to have that. But then if you're studying for a final, you may want to shift and kind of learn in a few different spots. So that's just, again, don't take this as gospel. Just take this as I should try that maybe. And then if there are certain tools to help you focus, like the personal focus tool on the iPhone, uh, some people can listen to music and do fine. Some people can't. Chewing gum can help, right? I've got cough drops is my thing that sometimes helps. And then digitally as well. Right, I, I was when my students shared their screen and they got 10,786 new emails. Like it does, it's, I try to not to be stressed out by it, but some people that it doesn't bother them. The question is though, like if you've got a million tabs, would closing some of them help you find things more easily? Uh, right, just kind of seeing what can we shut off? What can we tune out? One of the most important executive function skills is self-inhibition, which I think some of us, you know, we all struggle with this in certain ways, but you need to know yourself and just what, what's gonna waste your time, right? Is it the World Cup? Um, is it, I just go and I like to read about, I don't know, this type of music. So if there are well-worn tracks where you always go, so like a lot of people open their phone and there's a certain app or there's a certain website they always go to, the more well-worn it is, the more you probably need to change that. So we'll talk about what is, make what's easy difficult and make what is difficult easier for yourself. This is the most challenging part and least fun part of executive function. There's a lot of website blockers. I'm going old school. And so I, I found myself being on the internet a bit too much and just, it was overstimulating me and distracting me. And so I actually just disabled JavaScript on my phone. So very few websites work. And then when they do, it's very limited capacity. And you know, for me, it just helped me from kind of uselessly looking at news, right? Or just kind of browsing the internet when I've got better things to do. Even if that better thing to do is just to deconnect, right? And just rest for 10 minutes. Interruptions are bad. If you ever like, have seen a teacher get just super angry at a student for interrupting, the reason is we know that those interruptions harm both the students and honestly the lesson and the teacher. Every inter interruption will take minutes of recovery time, even if it's just a short, I'm looking at a text. It degrades accuracy and it affects overall product. And then there's also um, our, like, our working memory, so kind of our short-term memory. 
So if you're trying to study and keep something in your brain, if you take a quick distraction, it is much more likely to be pushed out. It shifts you from this deep processing situation to much more shallow. There are very few people in this world who can multitask like true multitaskers. A lot of us think we can, but most of us are monotaskers. We can do one thing at a time and we should. This is something I see a lot. And again, I mean, personally, I do it too. Like I'll be eating breakfast and I'll, I'll be on my phone. Um, but I, I often feel more relaxed if I'm just eating breakfast, right? Or if, even if it's like reading something hard copy rather than on my phone. But when you're working, you just wanna be working, right? You have to have that good quality work time, just like we need good quality play time, which I know can be at a premium. But that's important too, right? We've got to establish healthy brown boundaries and say, if I'm going to go out for a couple of hours with friends, I'm going to do that. And then I'll come back and do what I need to do. But creating those boundaries, just making sure that if you have the play and you're not letting work bleed in, we need the other side too. We need work time with no play. So I mentioned this, if it's social media or if it's gaming, you have to make it harder for yourself to access, right? So like set some screen time limits. Uh, that won't be fun, right? But you got to do that or put it in a different room or hide it out, hide, hide the console away for a few weeks. Uh, don't make sure your parents do that for you. It'll just create resentment on both ends, right? So if planning isn't easy for you, you got to think about how can you make it easier and better suited to you? These are skills you can develop even if you feel like, well, I'm just not good at this. I just, I just have attention issues and I just want to play the video game know that that's a little bit of self-defeating. We need that positive self-talk of, even if I feel like weaker or my, my executive function skills might be lower than some people, if you, if you really target them and focus on improving them, I promise that you will, right? Again, even without teaching or coaching, executive function skills improve as we live and just age, but there are a lot of things we can do to really hone in. So just be honest with yourself. That's a big part of this. Procrastination, of course, is a big thing. Um, I would say a majority of my students probably, just from what I can, I can infer, I can infer they, they do their homework like the last day before the session. And not ideal. I mean, it can work for some people, but it's much better if we break it up. We'll talk about that a bit more. And different people procrastinate in different ways and for different reasons. So you want to think about what's your style of procrastination? Are you doing it because you want to create a challenge for yourself? Uh, are you doing it because you're afraid of failing? And there's some subconscious thing in there of like, well, if I start studying, then I'm going to, I don't like this. I associate it with negative performance. That's natural, right? We like what we're good at and we're good at what we like, but we can improve at the other stuff. Uh, so think about like, what are the world-worn paths of where I'm seeking time into? Um, how can I counter this procrastination pull? Uh, self-reward, self-consequencing. So th these differ from person to person, but setting little benchmarks. And I definitely think not saving the hardest thing for last is important because then you kind of have that specter hanging over your head. Hard things first, and then you reward yourself with rest and easier things as you go along. Yeah, if you get the hardest thing done first, that will help a ton. And then in this society, we're, we're not very good at asking for help. Uh, but especially I think students are, are afraid of it a lot of times. Attending office hours shows dedication and interest. Same with emailing your teacher, although I think probably most teachers prefer if you just come to office hours uh, or do both. Find a study partner. So like if you're emailing your teacher, be thoughtful about that, right? Make sure that it's something that's a really, you know, a question that demonstrates your own interest and in hard work. Uh, study partner or small group works for some people. Sometimes you just need a tutor to help get you through it. Searching the internet, be careful with that. But yeah, I do think that certainly if you're going through something other people have, but also if there's a, like a topic that you're not sure of, there's probably something out there. And then using a study guide, either self-created, which is ideal, or sometimes teachers give you study guides. So just know that there are resources out there. You're not all alone. And this is a skill to develop too, is just how to advocate for yourself. You gotta know who to ask for help. This is people that intuitively 
you trust and you know have your best interest in mind. Where like, I think all my students when I taught in the school knew they could come to me, I hope so at least, because I told them that I cared and I showed them that I cared. Uh, and you can you can kind of see who who really wants to help and who's overwhelmed or who doesn't care or and mo most teachers do right. But I think you also have to get them at the right time, right? So office hours is always good, or maybe even setting up, hey, you know, Mrs. So and so, I'm having trouble with this. Is there a good time that we could talk about it? I would have loved to hear that as a teacher because it shows you respect my time, but also are interested in improving. And I would have bent over backwards to make make sure there was some good time for us to work on it. So advocate for yourself. I mean, I, I really do think teachers appreciate that more than students know. When we're talking final exam review, when you schedule it, you don't want to do this block studying of like, okay, here I'm three hours I'm studying for this and that. You want to do a lot of shorter sessions and schedule breaks. Right. This is a lot of executive executive function coaches are big on the big calendar, print out a huge calendar. And so you've got it on the wall and can see it very clearly. I use Google Calendar for everything. And what's nice is you can track your projects. You can put deadlines in there. Um, you can schedule in breaks. You can see here, work for an hour, then take a break, then do worksheets, then a break. If you don't schedule those, you probably won't take those breaks, to be honest or it'll become less, less structured and just more of like a, I'm not actually filling my tank break. Uh, but scheduling downtime and playtime as well as work time. And I, executive function skills are not just applying to high school students. So I think we often see these different times like sixth, seventh, eighth grade transition, this sophomore, junior, senior year, it can be really hard. And then transitioning into college are the biggest times. But like I, I, when I learned about executive function a few years ago, I was thinking, man, I could probably still benefit from some of this coaching. Because I like to schedule downtime, and if I don't, I probably won't take it. And see here, here's an example. This is probably more of a college type of final exam schedule. But notice you've got breaks in there, and then interleaving, which just means like while you're studying, you're kind of going in within that to different things. And one would think, oh, well, I'm switching it up. That's going to make me confused. But we talked earlier about how that actually taking those breaks and switching up something brand new doesn't tend to detract from your memory. But you see, we've got time for lunch. We've got time for sleep and Starbucks. We've got time for a break, right? So you don't just want to go, go, go. To me, I'm looking at that Monday and thinking, eesh, 5.30 to 9 o'clock, no breaks. I, I wouldn't have done that. But then there's a lot of things in here that I like, like two hours, two and a half hours between tests, stuff like that. We love acronyms. So our acronym here is GOAT, which stands for greatest of all time. Um, G, setting goals. So having one like uh, safe goal, meaning I'm pretty sure I could attain this, but then one stretch goal. So I want to do this, but if I can get to this benchmark, even better. But again, don't go overboard. A lot of my students just work too hard and are too hard on themselves. We want to be realistic, right? We don't want to get overwhelmed with this stuff. The O in GOAT is for organization, right? So we've got goal setting, organization, um, routines, setting aside what you need, pencil, paper, textbook, calculator, flashcards, and then putting study time on your calendar too, right? So like. Yes, of course, I've got a final exam on Thursday. I know I'll study for it on Wednesday, but put it in. So it's not like a 7 p.m. till question mark. It's more like 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., and let's see where we're at. The A is for attention. So focusing in on schoolwork and removing distractions because multitasking doesn't really work. Give yourself short breaks to recharge, but don't let it become a long break, right? So like make if, if, if it's, if you need 30 minutes, okay, but then make it 30 minutes. If it's more like 10 or 15, then hold yourself to that. And then T is for testing, meaning test yourself, write things down for yourself. The more you paraphrase, the better. This comes into play on SAT, ACT as well. And, you know, when I know that a student's reached master level is when they can teach it back to me. 
right? So it's like, okay, let's, we, we do it. I teach to them. We look at process. And then as soon as I think they've got it, it's all right, you do this and then teach back to me how I should do it. Because if someone can teach it, then that means they really understand the content. So teaching it to yourself, even if that's just speaking in the mirror or a picture or a pet or, you know, a parent, guardian, friend, teaching. Uh, Kathleen Treza, who's a big name in the world of education, um, Chunk Chu Check is the method that, that she's espoused, which is really the right way to learn. Meaning, again, whenever we know this, like if you have a teacher who teaches the same thing for an hour and drones on, after a few minutes, people will zone out and they'll get a lot more from the beginning and the end. Law school was a lot of that. But if you can just break it up as like, so for example, the tutoring session, 10 minutes on this, then a short break, 10 minutes on that. Every time we learn something, we need to chew on it. That might mean practice it, do a few questions yourself, and then check it to see if you're actually getting it, right? That's the doing a question, doing a different question, and then teaching it back. So we're breaking it up into manageable chunks, actively processing that, not passively, and then verifying that we really feel good about, I know this now. So into kind of the, we're about halfway through, we're over, um, just about how to review more effectively. Again, take this as, some of these slides might have something for you that you're like, man, I haven't thought of that, this would help me. It doesn't need to be, I must do this in every single sense of the word, I'm sure most of you are doing most of the right things, and there are a few little things you could change to help yourself. We're going to get into linking and anchoring a little bit. So a lot of people are visual people. If you're a visual person, make sure that you're drawing things. That can be really on almost any topic. Uh, my history teacher in high school did everything with flowcharts. So you know, one thing led to another, led to another. Uh, which for me was great. For some people, they didn't like that as much. They weren't as visual. Uh, anchoring is, is meaning like I learned something, but I really want it to stick. So sometimes if you can connect it to something you've learned before, that can help a lot with the anchoring. Drawing things out. I mean, doodling is good for a quick break, but also drawing to actually help yourself cement or learn something. And then little, well, I guess little diagrams showing how things are connected. Again, this applies in various topics. So it could be anything from math, to history to physics, uh, but it's about what is the pathway my brain likes to take to study? Do I need to see it all out on one page or is it okay if I've got it all in text? Beyond constructing, we also have to generate it. So this is the teach part of it. Uh, always wanna kind of check in as we're going. It's like, okay, so this is true, and then you ask the student, why is that true? Or uh, what would you do if you saw this? What's our first step? The more they have to recall that, the better. We're not practicing the studying, we're practicing if you saw this on the test, what would you do? When we get to test day, what are you worried about? Uh, if we saw this exact topic again on test day, how would you handle it, right? So it's all about, this is a problem for future me, but only present to me can make that better. The quality of how you process information is much more important than how much you process. You are better off working through material deeply once than shallowly 15 times. And depending on your type of processing, it will lead to better or worse memory retention. So going through something really deeply once or twice, much, much better than like seeing it in little bite-sized chunks over and over. Here's some just info on utility of various learning techniques. So you can see the low ones are highlighting, rereading, summarizing. Those are fairly low utility. Yes, they will help. Yes, they're the easiest, unless they're a lot of what a lot of people do. So that can help you memorize very much. I find that highlighting and underlining is better for staying alert and awake, but unless you go back, you're not gonna memorize it. But then if you're paraphrasing and explaining it to yourself along the way, that can help. If you're interleaving, that's at the bottom where you're bringing in different things within a certain topic and you're kind of jumping around, that can help. But the two best are 
testing, right? So like you're going and you're actually taking a practice test, right? Or, or a worksheet or what have you. And then distributed practice rather than blocked practice, meaning don't wait till the last minute, don't do it in one day, take five deep processing one hour sessions rather than one five hour session, right? So making sure that it's distributed. What testing does for, for SAT ACT, it's mock tests, right? When we start and then every four or five weeks, it locks in learning, it measures progress. For me, it also shows us mistakes, which I think is the most important part of this. We, we need to make mistakes. It's good. We learn from them. Uh, learn much more from mistakes than what we do well or get right. And just testing generally, it, it alters the way you encode information. Uh, it can put people in that testing environment, which sometimes raises stress levels, but you need to be in that environment. And honestly, forcing yourself to memorize it for a test actually adjusts the connections in your brain. So it, it, there's a reason why it helps you learn. Practice tests are the best way to learn. They're also the most burdensome, right? It could take the longest and be the least fun, but testing, checking your answers, fixing the mistakes, that's where a tutor can help a lot. And it's not just like, I must sit down and take a full test, right? Testing could be teaching someone else like we talked about, posing questions to yourself or someone else. Flashcards are wonderful. Uh, taking little notes that you can quiz yourself. So I think flashcards kind of would help with that. Paraphrasing and explaining to yourself, so you're kind of walking through everything you need, right? That shows that it's not just if I have it in front of me, I can recall it in teacher speak. I know it in my own words. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even just like, I think writing stuff down is huge, but taking your big study guide and making it more condensed to what's most important or the things that you're having trouble really imprinting in your mind. So I think we've answered this, but the question is, is it better to block study or to distribute it over time? Well, here's a study that shows it's definitely better to mix your practice up. So you can see there, there's three different finals. The first person did three sessions for the first final, three for final B, three for final C. When they were doing it, they were pretty accurate, right? So it looks like 60%, uh, or sorry, 89% accuracy for the blockers, block practice. But then they took the test one week later, how much did they retain? Like less than a quarter of it. Because they didn't reinforce it. But if you learn A and then B and then C and then reinforce A and then do it again a week later, those people actually were not as accurate during practice, were making mistakes, were learning from them, one week later, they were more accurate because they retained the information. And they also, like these last three, A, B, C, really helped click things in rather than these three Cs pushing A and B out of your mind. So distribute your studying little ways. This, I think we've touched on. All right, so it'll be a little repetition late, which is reinforcing some of the most important things here. We switch topics, brand new topic can help a lot, um, making sure that you're taking good breaks and, and active breaks. Active breaks as opposed to passive learning. So for example, if you get a perfect copy of a teacher's notes, it doesn't actually help you very much. Like, yeah, if you really studied them and learned everything and paraphrase it, fine. But there's no really, there's no struggle or making mistakes if you just get those notes. Same with rereading a chapter, not much. Right, so the more passive learning seems, the less likely it will stick. That's why people should have a pencil in hand. That's why we'll write things down. No passive learning. What are the things we can do to make it more active? Make study guides. Create concept maps, which again is just kind of putting some visual for yourself. It can look very different for different people. Uh, outlining, organizing info in a chapter, right? So just making sure you're structured. Uh, putting a list of topics you think could come up on the test. So putting yourself there on test day. Um, pros and cons of certain positions if there's like an essay test. Uh, looking at questions at the end of chapter in a textbook and making sure that you're comfortable with them. Even if you've answered them, go do them again. And look for themes in either the material or in what you're missing. Those are all really good strategies. Notice a ton of these are just you writing down, right? If you take ownership and rewrite something, even if it's just like repetition, it can really help you have things stick. Here are some other memorization strategies. So we talked about deep versus shallow strategies. Uh, if you're a visual person, draw pictures. Mm -hmm. Mnemonic devices are ways to remember things, right? Like Raven, 
which is remember affect is a verb and effect is a noun, which I think one of the previous slides actually switched up. Um, there's also stuff like PEMDAS. So that's just for order of operations. Self-testing we've talked about and this forced retrieval practice of, I know I'm gonna need this on test day. This is how, like, this is how I'm gonna have to memorize it. And so you're kind of rewiring your brain to figure out how am I gonna remember this on test day? Where do I go in my brain for this? Right, and making sure that we have a resource. Think of the brain as a network of connections. And as you study you need to build connections across ideas, that's the anchoring and the linking that helps improve our memory. And in general, ideas just won't stick if they aren't connected, right? So if idea four and idea two are not linked to anything, right? Like it's just, there's not gonna be a whole lot of understanding versus if you see how idea one and idea three are related, you'll have a better understanding of both. As you can see there. Mnemonic, tough word to say and spell. Some examples, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So that's PEMDAS for math. Sokotoa, which is sine, cosine, and tangent for trig. Uh, to spell mnemonic, we know that M comes before N, so that might help you remember. And there are lots of different kinds, and there's no bad mnemonic, as long as it helps you remember. So you can see another couple of interesting ones here for music. Uh, there's rhyme and alliteration. Uh, I use like, area squaria for people to remember that the area of a circle is the pi r squared one, whereas circumference is the other one, two pi r. Because a lot of people think area is two pi r, but no, area squaria, pi r squared. It's corny, but it works. You can also trade mnemonic devices with friends. Remember that something that works for one person may not necessarily work for you, and don't be self-conscious if it's a weird mnemonic, right? Whatever helps. Some people are really uh, rely on color coding. So color coding your notes. So maybe in history, we've got one color when they're talking about famous people, one for historic events, one for just industrial revolution or for a certain historical concept. For math, maybe we change it up for formulas, for a term or for proofs. And that can really, again, differ from person to person. For me, that wouldn't do much good, but I see the appeal of that and like little sticker notes in the book and all that. I think this is crucial. Asking questions and writing out your answers. My gosh, nobody does this, but it's, it's the best way you could study, right? So like, if you know they're gonna ask you something about the industrial revolution or about the invention of the telegram, right? You, you wanna make sure that you can answer these questions. What are we talking about? Who, when, where, why? And then what was the impact, right? If you can answer that a little bit, then that's something that you'll probably recall on testing or you're more likely to. I think I mentioned the 50-10 rule. So time management is huge. Know how much time you have. For a lot of us, time is at a premium, especially certain times of the year. My students do not sleep very much and I hate it, but it sucks because the most important thing is, you know, a couple nights sleep before a test. So setting up a plan can help. Sometimes it's inevitable and we're not gonna get a great night's sleep, but if you can set yourself up for it, you got to. And then generally, this is the maximum I would do is 50 minutes studying, 10 non-studying. I think even 45, 15 would be okay, uh, but, or like 30, 10, 30, 10. The key is don't go for more than an hour at a time without taking a break. It's too much, right? Get some water, get a snack, walk around. Just change a little bit. Don't get into a deep distraction, but we definitely need that break every hour, even just for the rest of your eyes. They say every 20 minutes you're looking at a screen, you should spend 20 seconds looking away, right? So that's something I know that I don't do nearly enough. Knowing your opponents, we're going to get into um, a couple of strat specific strategies, but figure out, make sure you know what the exam is going to cover. Most teachers are fairly straightforward about that, unless they teach physics probably or calculus, make sure you get a clear picture of the material from your teacher. If you really don't know, ask classmates, right? Ask the teacher. Some teachers are really difficult and you just can't know, but most teachers will let you know what's on the test. What types of questions, multiple choice or not? How many uh, do we need? Like how are your written responses supposed to look? What is the teacher like, 
right? Really understanding what the expectations are. Uh, will I get credit if I show my work on math but miss it? Or will that teacher just not give you credit at all? Because that'll tell you where to prioritize time. And get all the intel you can, right? So don't be nervous to ask the teacher how to prepare. That's a nice question for a teacher to get. If you know certain classmates or friends are really successful, check in with them. Hey, what did you do? Right? Don't just assume, oh, this person is smart and I'm dumb. Like that is not accurate almost ever, like pretty much never. It's usually maybe that information clicks better with them because they like it, or and or maybe they have these different study skills or strategies and things that really will help you. And just you might get something from them like, oh shoot, I should have been doing that all along. That will help. Upperclassmen who have experience, good study halls, review sessions are other good ways to really check in with the teacher and also demonstrate that you care. Teachers really do look at that. If you're expecting like a letter of recommendation for a teacher, go to those study halls and review sessions, right? That's even, you know, a good time to, to test whether you've got that relationship and that would be a good person to ask. And so on that note, study the test before you study. Are you allowed to move from one section to another? On ACT, you can't do that. In SAT, you can't do that, but some, some teachers allow it. So maybe you want to start with the stuff that you know is just in your brain, but might escape the harder stuff. Uh, how deep of your knowledge, how deep of knowledge are, is expected, or do you just need to know the basics? Uh, do we need to connect things? Is there partial credit? What does it count towards the grade? All those impact how you should study and how much time to allot. And just also make you more sure of what's coming, right? We need to know what to expect. We're running a little on time, so but I think we're pretty much done here. So I'm gonna leave it a bit of time for questions. Um, 50, 10 time rule, I really think that even in that 10 minute break, cell phone, iPod, laptop, it, it's really easy to get too engrossed in those. For me, instrumental music never worked, but lyrics can compete for attention. So especially like hip hop or you know alternative music or something that's really kind of active can be hard to double task with that. So to wrap up, in advance of finals, maybe the first step I would do is reviewing my notes. All right, what's the general thing? It'll refresh some things from that class. Second, if there's a study guide, check it out, figure out what you don't know. Third, go to the textbook or whatever the materials were. You can't read it all again, but visuals can help. So graphs and figures and formulas, those will remind you of things. And if you felt weak initially when you reviewed your notes or study guide, you can focus in on those in the text. So don't go to the text as, a, as the first step, go there when you know what to look for. If you feel like you're, you're like, I got this, move on, right? Make sure that you're not going into stuff that's not gonna be on the test. So focus on the stuff from the unit or in the study guide. Uh, make sure if the teachers mention something a bunch, right? Topics they stressed, like that's what they'll probably ask about. The fourth step is then go back to your notes and think, okay, now what, now that I've gone over this, what do I now need more material for? And you're probably gonna be crisper at going back and getting that from the book. And again, I'm just saying it one more time, write things down. It's all about working memory and what you can hold in your brain. If a partner helps do it, but not if it's a distraction. Generate and create to remember. And so reviewing the review here, set a schedule, 50-10 rule, write things down, be organized and plan. If you know it, move on. Repeat, repeat, repeat. So as often as you can, ideally that chunk to check and do it over the course of a few days to reinforce. And if you have extra time, just use it for review. Don't burn out. But if you have extra time, just use it for general review. All right, test day strategies. So always the last thing for ACT, SAT is we lay out, what are we gonna bring? So make sure you get that the night before. What's allowed? If you can have a calculator, make sure you bring the right one, right? ACT, SAT give you, like you can use any calculator basically, TI-84, TI-INSPIRE, like these graphing calculators that people don't think they can use, they can and should. Uh, if it's a virtual test, just make sure you know what you can and can't bring. So always just setting up yourself, setting yourself up for success that way. And then eating right and sleeping right, Monday night sleep affects Wednesday morning's tests. So because we feel we went through 36 hours previously, the most important night's sleep is not the night before the test, it is the night before the night before. Other than that, I would say don't do a huge amount of different stuff. 
do what you do in a normal morning and just make sure you're feeling good. I'm gonna zoom through this. This is one of our amazing tutors, Sarah, um, and instructional designers. But I think that it's, it's repetition. So I think at this point, we've got the skills. What I wanna make sure of before we close today is we're gonna launch a quick poll. And so this is just for, uh, to see if you're educator, student, parent. Um, we're running a promo. So I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about what Apple Ruth does, and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. Again, our three cornerstones are academic tutoring. So if you have a student who's struggling in calculus or in US history and just needs some support, we offer academic prep. You can see that poll launching now. Test prep, which is ACT, SAT, PSAT. That's what I do. Um, if you call and request tutor, you can request to work with me directly. But you also have, we also have many, many amazing tutors, some in person in New York, Seattle, Atlanta, uh, and the various DC, the places that we have offices. Uh, I do all of mine online. And then executive function coaching. So again, those skills we talked about today that we can develop and really improve. We also have a new writing workshop. You're gonna get a link in the chat to um, contact a program advisor if you want. Most of our PAs are or were former tutors. Uh, so they'll just give you information. There's no hard sell. They are just really, we can give you exactly what you need to know. Uh, but this is a very cool new thing because we haven't worked much with writing in the past. And then finally, $150 diagnostic for executive function coaching. The mind print thing is the coolest thing ever. It's like a mock test for executive functioning skills. So your diagnostic will get you a custom coaching match. It's 30 minutes and you get a custom plan, which usually is like 30 minute sessions once or twice per week at the beginning. At the beginning. And you can use that link in the chat to schedule a 15 minute time to talk that's not the diagnostic, so there's no charge for that. All right, that was a lot of slides. We've got a holiday sale ongoing. It's the best deal of the year for sure. Uh, you can save up to $1,500 on test prep. So if you're a rising, like I said, if you're a 10th grader or 11th grader and you're starting to think about test prep, now's a good time to sign up and target a few tests, like maybe the March and May SAT or the February, April, June ACTs. And we just got a few minutes. So if there are any questions, please go ahead and shoot them in the Q&A and I'll be happy to answer them. And if you are satisfied, feel free to take off and thank you for joining today. Not seeing any, I'll leave it open for a minute or so. Oh, here we go. All right, the first question is, are there test prep courses for AP courses? The answer is yes. We don't offer that many group classes for those. Uh, and I don't do a whole lot of AP prep, but we have a lot of tutors who do specialize in that. So like, let's say, you know, you're in AP environmental science and you want some sessions to prepare for the test in December or in May. Uh, yes, that would be the academic tutoring. And yes, we definitely offer those. So it, it would usually be done individually with like one hour or 90 minute sessions one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, that's often the best bet. Um, the, okay, the next two questions are about how much we charge. I honestly, like, I would go to the website. Um, I know that Apple with charges more than I make as a tutor, <laughs> unfortunately, but um, this promo definitely lessens the blow. And as far as sales deals for executive function coaching, I actually am not sure. Check with the PA. I don't see it here, but I wonder if during the promo, if you got like a package for executive function, if they might, uh, it's worth asking, but I don't think there's a formal deal for executive function coaching right now. All right, here's our last question, which is really a perfect one for me. When should students take an SAT or ACT prep class, whether you are doing uh, group tutoring or um, individual, the earliest I see someone start for ACT, SAT is sophomore year if they're a super high scorer. That would be spring of sophomore year or summer before junior year. If you don't think the student's super high scoring, like aiming for a perfect PSAT score in October of junior year, then I'd probably start fall of junior year or spring semester of 11th grade, especially after you've got algebra one and hopefully algebra two under your belt is when I would start SAT, ACT prep. The latest you'd want to start would be probably spring of junior year because summer before senior year is often too late. 
Um, all right, well, the last one is suggestions for future reading. To be honest, the expert on executive function is Jed Appleruth, who's the founder of the company. He goes around, does presentations. He also is one of our coaches. And I'm quite confident that if you reached out uh, for a little bit more information, just to one of these, the PAs at the link, then I'm quite confident to show up with some information, right? And, and he's the brain to pick really. But yeah, some of the authors we cited too, like Ka Kathleen Kreza and a few other others here that we cited were also the good ones. If you have a 1300 in the PSAT and you're a 10th grader, yeah, start prepping. Uh, if especially, oh yeah, if you're, if you're, if a 1300 in PSAT is a ninth grader, don't prepare yet. But when he's a sophomore, start thinking about it so that he can get a high PSAT score junior year. All right, all, we've reached our time. Thank you so much for joining. Hope it was helpful. Have a lovely evening.